Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at Edward's A6 M2N, also known as the Roof. It's in 1 to 48th scale, and this is also my first ever Edward kit on the channel. So let's see what it has in store. So then, as this kit is a preppy pack, that means it comes with some masks and also this lovely photo etch fret. The only downside to the photo etch fret is that it didn't match the colour which I had personally thought was the interior colour for the roof, so I had to swap it out for a slightly darker shade of this green, but not the end of the world. So talking about the actual photo etch, it is brilliant, it is nice and vibrant, it's got superb details on it, and if you spend a bit of time getting it all into place, it makes the cockpit look so much busier and so much more intricate and detailed. There's no need to worry about putting photo etch in the wrong places as Edward's instructions provide a brilliant guide on where to put all the different bits and bobs. As you can see on screen, I'm just fitting the seat with the photo etch seat belts on. The photo etch seat belts are sometimes a little bit of a, a pain to make them look quite realistic as they are metal and as we know seat belts are usually a fabric and fabrics are more floppy in nature uh, so you have to do a bit of bending to try and make it look a little bit more natural. So here you can see me inserting the control stick into the base of the cockpit floor. Um, the thing that I really do enjoy about the, the Japanese cockpits especially is they feel very, very mechanical. You know, you can see all these kind of exposed elements and has this pretty darn cool feeling about it. So going back onto the build, here you can see me inserting the frame with the seat on it onto the cockpit floor. This has an interlocking sort of pin system. Very, very nice. Uh, and look, without any glue, it's just sitting there with no issue whatsoever. Going back onto some more photo etch now, here you can see me putting some of the uh, gauges and stuff onto the side walls of the cockpit. This uh, was very reminiscent of my previous build using some Red Fox Studio stuff. Uh, you have to get rid of all of the underlying details if you want to use the photo etch. Uh, Edward do supply the option though, if you don't want to use the photo etch, they don't force you into it, which is very, very nice. Uh, but of course, I did want to use photo etch as it looked pretty darn cool. Speaking of photo etch, here you can see the front instrument panel and the dials and everything on this are so crisply, you know, printed. It just looks absolutely superb. Another thing that goes along with the cockpit assembly, as you saw in the previous clip, was the build-up of the guns, specifically the 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns. They're very nicely moulded, you know, they have nice indentations for the muzzles and all this sort of stuff, so looks brilliant. As I was rambling on about guns and all this sort of shebang, I mixed up a dusty looking wash. The reason I went for a dustier and a lighter wash is because this green that is used in the cockpit is very, very dark green. and it's just a shame because it hides a lot of that detail so by using a lighter wash it just helps to really pick out those details as it will build up around all of these details and just helps helps it easier to pick out with your eye talking more about the process what i did was mix up this wash uh, that was done with some whites and some peachy looking oil paints that was then diluted down with some white spirits before then being put onto the model left to dry for a little bit and then i can clean it up using a clean brush doused in white spirit so once everything is all cleaned up and I'm happy with how it looks, I can now start to bring all of the elements together. This includes fitting the front instrument panel and the side walls and just starting to really populate it. I can also now fit the front forward facing two 7.7mm machine guns as this is part of the cockpit assembly. So with the cockpit completely finished, I can now move on to joining the two fuselage halves together. So usually you would actually fit your cockpit assembly on one side of the fuselage half and then cement them together. However, Edward actually make use of a different technique where you insert your cockpit assembly from the bottom in. Very interesting and I actually quite enjoyed it. But before I can move on to doing all of that, I need to build up the rudder. So the rudder is built up of a couple of different pieces. Uh, it's really quite simple to put together. No fit issues here at all, you know, it just almost clicks together. It felt very Tamiya-esque, which is, you know, definitely definitely a surprise from a manufacturer that isn't Tamiya. But something that does have to be sorted out is this quite large seam on the top and the bottom of the fuselage. To sort this out, I'm going to just use my usual technique, which is using some of VMS's Flexi CA glue along the seam and then sanding it back using Ammo Mix Sander. Ammo Mix Sanding Stick is pretty much just has... A variety of different grits which help you to bring the finish up to something which doesn't have any imperfections in it. I really enjoy using it as it gives us this really nice polished finish which uh, allows me to then restore any of the details which have been lost through the sanding process. 
So the joys of an Edouard kit is the fact that the surface detail is superb. You have all of these lovely rivets and panel lines which are at a brilliant depth, but that does mean that you unfortunately lose all these details and they have to be re-scribed afterwards. To do this, I actually picked up for the first time a riveter. Uh, the riveter just pretty much allows you to restore these details instead of doing them with maybe an old needle or one of those separate press punches. So the riveter is very simple to use. You just lightly press it into the plastic and roll it across where you want the rivets to go. Very, very simple, really easy to use. We'll definitely be doing it again. So another imperfection which I have to sort out is filling in this large gap on the rear aspect of the cockpit. So to sort this out, I initially cut off a little bit of um, wood from somewhere. I think it was balsa wood. Anyway, this was attached from the inside of the fuselage to create a, almost a, a flooring as per se. And this just created a great base for me to fill up the gap with some Vallejo putty. That can then be sanded back and it looked okay. Not perfect, but it all do. So here we can now see me inserting the cockpit from the underside as I described. It is definitely interesting. The only issue that I had was the 7.7mm cannons kind of slipped out of place. So I just had to use a pair of tweezers to get them back into the slots where they had to be. And it was all sorted. So moving on to something a bit different, I'm now looking at the wing assembly. So the first thing to do here is actually to insert a wing spar. The wing spar ensures that the uh, model features the positive dihedral that the roof actually has, and I'm sure it adds an element of support. One or two aspects can be added to the rear part portion of the wing, and then I can cement the top halves of the wings to the bottom half of the wings. This was quite a fiddly process as the locating tabs and pins are rather small. This doesn't mean that they're bad, it just means that there's quite a lot of fiddling around before you get it in the right place. But once they're in the right place, they lock in tight and it's a very nice alignment. I can now also fit the ailerons to the outer edges of the wings. These have, once again, very nice alignment, no issues whatsoever here. So I'd like to point out here that making sure you have a lot of nose weight in the nose, of course, is very vital for this uh, aircraft, purely because I'm definitely on the edge of having a tail sitter here. And that, that was with quite a lot of nose weight in there. I think I used some like 10 cent coins. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure why. I think it's the only thing that was laying around and it fit perfectly in there and they were quite heavy. But whatever you use for your nose weight, make sure you have a lot of it in there. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the tail sitter. So with the wings and ailerons fitted on, we were looking a bit more like a plane and we can now look on to focusing on the engine. So the engine has these two really nasty eject pin marks in some really nasty places. So to sort them out, I just used a Dremel. Uh, you have to be really careful here as it is quite thin plastic and you don't want to get rid of those sort of locating notches as per se. So be careful here, take your time, but you will be okay. I then based everything in a extreme metal color by AK, the aluminium color I believe. And then onto this piece here, this was slightly my fault and slightly the manufacturer's fault because it was a bit mucked up on the sprue and then I accidentally made it more mucked up by not pulling it off correctly. So I'm sure you'll have more luck, but just be very careful with that piece and don't fall into the same trap as I did. So I then went on to use a dark wash to highlight all of these brilliant details which were lost by the very light aluminium colour. So I recommend that you do the same because the details that Edward offers are really, really nice and they do need to be, you know, highlighted. Otherwise, they can very easily just morph into nothingness. So I can now move on to making up and building up the cowling. So Edward used a really cool system. It's like this piece which acts as a jig so you kind of lay all the pieces on it and then you can glue it together however you have to be really careful um, not to actually glue the part to the jig otherwise you are screwed so a little bit scary but works quite well a bit fiddly but I really enjoyed the process as it does create a very nice looking cowling and I believe that the jig system is just you so that Edward can mold all of that detail the whole way around the cowling rather than it being one piece and losing detail in certain places. Might be wrong, but that, from my understanding, that's what it's for. I can now go on to building up the main float, which is very iconic on the roof. This builds up very nicely, and I also would recommend putting some nose weight into this as well, just to really ensure that you don't have a tail sitter. I forgot to hit, however, do not make my mistake, do put some nose weight in it. I tried to rectify the issue by putting some uh, BBs, metal BBs in the top. That did not work whatsoever. 
Another thing to be careful with is these uh, sort of strut elements here do ensure that they have more of an obtuse angle going out of the float rather than the other way, uh, which is acute. There we go. I know my language. Uh, this just ensures that you have the right placement of them and they line up to the matching recess slots for them. It does fit together very, very well, this kit. It's uh, a real joy to make, but that is only if you take the time to really read the instructions and clean up is necessary as we've seen on the engine so with the floats on this build really is starting to come together there are only a couple of other elements to now put on that includes this ladder the ladder is optional but i think the ladder you know i, I like ladders i know it sounds a bit odd but i do think they bring another element to a model so i was sure to put that on other elements include now the engine which was painted up along with the cowling and also using the provided mask set to mask off the canopies the mask set fits perfectly, which is understandable as it is an Edward mask, so on the whole, they are very good. Do be careful though to put the masks on the correct pieces, or not the correct pieces, but the pieces that you'll be using for the canopy as there are different clear elements for different options as in having the canopy open or closed. So it's now time to go on to the first bit of painting. The first bit of painting is going to be painting the canopy in a black color. This is just ensuring that the inside frames are a black color and not anything like a silver or green color, which I'll be later spraying. Once I've allowed time for the black to completely dry, I can then go on to spraying the first base color onto this build. And that is going to be using AK's Extreme Metal Color Aluminium. This is going to act as a really, really nice base for any of the chipping effects, which I'm going to do later. This is sprayed with my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution with a 0.3mm nozzle at 25 psi. You might be wondering why I haven't used a primer before spraying this down and that is because I didn't have any primers with me at the moment which had a glossy finish and these metals really work the best if there's a glossy surface underneath. Once I was happy with how the aluminium looked I can then go on to highlighting a couple of panel lines using some metallic orange and some red colours. Before I do this, I want to actually create another chipping effect and the chipping effect which I'm initially going to do is going to be using a sponge chipping combined with some masking fluid and what that will do is just allow me to create some smallish chips between the aluminium and the reddish colour. The reason for me using the reddish orangey colour is just when I looked at some reference images it seemed that some of these chips had a, an orangey reddish uh, element to them and I believe this is from one of the types of primers that we used on the aircraft. When it comes to spraying down this reddy orangey colour, I'm just trying to focus it around the panel lines as that is where a majority of the, or at least a large majority of the chips are going to be. It's good to note that I'm not putting it over every single panel line, I'm just choosing a few, trying to keep it as random as I possibly can, as from, you know, looking at the aircraft, it's not uniform chipping, it's all over the blooming place. So that is what I'm trying to replicate. So once I was happy that I'd put the orangey colour in all the places that I felt was fit. I can now actually take off all of the masking chip fluids. To do this I'm just literally using my finger and rubbing it across and pretty much the friction just seems to pull it up. It's also a very good idea to completely kind of get a paper towel or a cloth and wipe down your um, model after doing this just to get rid of all of the weird little residue from the masking fluid. It's, it's a brilliant substance however it can get a little bit messy as per se. So once I was happy that on the whole all of the masking fluid has gone off I'm now going to tone down that effect as in my opinion it looked far too prominent. I think I might have toned it down a bit too much here however I'm still happy with the effect as in the final product if you look close enough you can still see these nice orangey reddy kind of tints around some of the chips which is exactly what I wanted to do. So I'm now actually going to leave the model for about a day just to ensure that all of the paint really binds into the plastic. Once that is done, I'm now going to be able to use the heavy chipping fluid. This is AK's heavy chipping fluid. I know there are quite a few out there, however, this is the one that I seem to get on with the best. I put two layers down of the chipping fluid and then I let it completely dry before now spraying on my final colours. For the final colours, I'm going to be using a Nakajima dark green along with an ash grey for the underside. Both of these colours are in fact acrylics and um, these are Amo Mega acrylics and I use them an awful lot in my builds just because I really enjoy working with them. So today I am spraying with my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution with a 0.3mm nozzle at around about 28 psi. I'm also being incredibly careful here not to drown the model with the paint because if I drown the model with the paint it's going to make it incredibly hard to activate that chipping fluid. So definitely spray lightly, that's my tip. I'm now going to use some blue tack to mask off the uh, 
division between the Nakajima green and the ash grey. I didn't film the ash grey as it was very very simple to spray, not too much required there. So in regards to the chipping fluid, all you do is you kind of lay down some water where you want to do some chipping, make sure the water is relatively warm, I'm not saying like scorching but warmish and then you can come in in my case i like using a um one of tamia's little cotton buds as they, they're quite tough actually and then just really really slowly kind of stippling and scraping away all of that sort of paint which you think should be gone you can always use reference images to you know of course refer to where the chipping should be and when i looked at some reference images i tried to concentrate a lot of the chipping on the main float and also at the, the, the sort of wing roots. The wing roots, since it spanned out a little bit up the fuselage, that is where the chipping seemed to be the most concentrated. And this was what I was left with as a final result, and I was very, very happy with this. A limitation with chipping fluid is the fact that you have to work relatively fast, and when you're doing that much chipping, you definitely feel like your neck's on the block, and you, you, you're trying to do it fast, but you're trying to do it authentic as well, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line to cross, but you can definitely make it look good. So with the main amount of chipping out of the way, I could then move on to doing a couple of the other elements which had to be masked off. This includes the leading edges and also the cowling that you can see me working on on screen. I then repeated the exact same process for these elements uh, just to help them tie into the model as you can't have like pristine looking leading edges when the rest of it is all smacked up. So after spending not too much time on the paint, you know, it was quite a quick paint job, I think can then go back on to a couple of sub-assemblies. Here you can see me working on the prop. This is just painted in a nice uh, silver or a bare aluminium colour. I think I went with silver here, actually. But anyway, that can then be slotted onto the aircraft and it looks pretty darn cool. So with the prop actually onto the aircraft, that is really the roof pretty much done. So I can now go on to another almost mini kit within a kit. And this is going to be building up the, the stand or I don't really know what to call it. I'm going to say the stand <laughs> it sits on. Uh, this builds up really nicely like the rest of the kit. There's no issues here. You have to spend a little bit of time on cleanup as there are one or two areas where, you know, if you don't clean it up properly, it's not going to go together as well. However, bit of time and you'll be absolutely fine. So the one issue that I, I can say that I had here was with these pieces here, they act as almost like they're solid points for the wheels, however they're not very solid. The instructions say that you should not glue these pieces as they'd want the, the wheels to move, however when I, I let them move that there, there just wasn't a close enough fit for them and that the, the the wheels actually ended up almost spewing out under the weight of the roof so i would personally recommend gluing these together maybe with a bit of super glue i just used extra thin cement and it worked fine but you know better to be safe than sorry so with the trolley oh right there we go i meant to say call it a trolley there we go with the trolley painted and it given a gloss varnish i can now go on to the decals so this is my second time using edward decals i used them on my phantom build and i didn't really know how to use them so this time i did a little bit more research and they went down far better i used ammo mix uh, setting and also solvent solution to get these down to help them conform to all the details and it worked very very well an issue that I had with the decals is that they were all incredibly pristine and this was not a pristine looking aircraft so I made the bold move to actually start destroying a couple of the decals. Here you can see me doing, uh, uh, these are kind of stencilish decals which go on the, the, the trailing edges of the wings so I'd rip them up and then paste, uh, not paste them, just put them onto the model in tiny little bits and it looked far far more realistic. So here you can see me using a heat gun to try and help the decal conform more into the details. However, be careful because you're going to see in a second my pitot tube. Look, there you go. It melts under the heat. So don't do that. Learn from <laughs> learn from my mistakes. Uh, yeah, don't be silly. With me melting pitot tubes out of the way, I can now do the the cover film cover film peel I guess that uh, the Edward decals allow you to do it pretty much means that you can get rid of this the sheen that decals have um, as Edward allow you to peel off the cover film really really cool definitely a little bit scary to do it but the final effect looks absolutely brilliant also you might be wondering why my insignia is absolutely perfect and that is because the Japanese had a lot of respect for the insignias and I believe it gave them good luck if they're in pristine condition so after most missions they would always be touched up so in regards to weathering, I wanted to try something quite out there for this one as well. I wanted to try and do a bit of a stressed skin effect. So to do that, I would just highlight the panels, um, the insides of the panels, sorry, with 
uh, an insignia sort of whitish oil paint and then I'm just going to blend it in. This leaves a darker patch on the outside of the um, outside of the panels where the panel lines are and it just gives us a fake illusion we'll call it. I'm pretty sure Plasmo did it when he did a zero. Uh, is it anywhere near as good as that? No, but <laughs> was I quite happy with it? Yeah. I'm sure if I spent a little bit more time on it and had some slightly better oil paints it would look far better. Another element that I wanted to add to this build was also bring in some highlights. To do this I'm going to use a grass green oil paint colour and just put it around a couple of the raised details and also around the edges of some panel lines. I can then blend this in using a clean brush with some white spirit and it just almost gives this this another element of this faded paint effect and that the, the paint has really been beaten up. So this light green just helps to bring out the highlights and it just adds another level. Um, I did speak about this in my previous video, the F14 Tomcat, and layers and levels to a model is really what helps to make them look quite interesting. Am I an expert at this? No. Am I trying to get a bit better? Yes, I am. So with all of the griminess and the different highlights all sorted out, I can then actually seal in all my effects using VMS's satin varnish. I didn't want to go for a matte varnish. Also, be careful not to knock your model over. Uh, anyway, I didn't want to go for a matte varnish purely because it, it would get rid of all of the sheen of the chipping and I still wanted to keep a bit of it. So with that, the final bits and bobs were pretty much just being done now. That includes taking off a couple of the masks, putting on one or two antennas, doing a bit of rigging from the antenna to the tail. You know, the normal bits and bobs. But really, that was this model finished. So I hope you have enjoyed this video. I know it's a little bit different to what I usually do, you know, quite an interesting subject, quite a harsh take on this subject. But let me know what you think down below. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy the final photos and videos. And I'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.
Thank you.